Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Tuesday, July 27th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, the history and future of billboard advertising. The surprisingly large challenge of recycling bowling balls. And the YouTube creator who just got hired by Lucasfilm. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Having driven over 30 hours across almost 2,000 miles of farmland in the American heartland last week, I had a lot of time to think about my surroundings. In particular, one ubiquitous item dotting the side of all American motorways. Not corn, although dang, there was a lot of that. But no, billboards. There are more than 340,000 billboards in the United States, making up a $6.5 billion industry. But for such big business, the product itself really hasn't changed much at all over the last two centuries. I'm sure there are some digital billboards now, and we had those sort of accordion ones that could switch between two or three ads back in the 90s, and there's always going to be some gimmick billboards. Growing up, I always loved passing by the Coors Light billboard on I-35 in Dallas, which features an actual rock face and functioning waterfall. Andrew Egan, writing at Tedium, dug into the history of the billboard last month, quote, The first billboards, as modern audiences would understand them, were, like many things, made of stone and created by ancient Egyptians. The purpose of the first known billboards was not to advertise the first consumer products, but to announce laws outside the city of Thebes circa 1000 BCE. Unlike simpler forms of advertising like posters and flyers, which are intended to be viewed up close, billboards seek to attract attention from further away. Ancient billboards required costly labor and resources that limited their use to important state business. As a result, billboards have rarely been used throughout human history. The circumstances that allowed billboards to flourish in modern society required new technology, along with a sudden explosion of consumer consumption." End quote. Egan notes it was the invention of the lithograph in the 1790s, which allowed for a proliferation of print advertising, as well as the explosion of consumer goods in the 1800s that set the stage for billboards. But according to all available origin stories, the man who really sealed the deal was Jared Bell. Bell was an event promoter for Ringling Circus in the 1830s, and he decided to make a splash. Instead of the traditional small, hand-painted signs that would line the roads letting passersby know about goods being sold at local farms and general stores, he printed up 50-foot-wide posters for the circus whenever it would be passing through towns. It wasn't long before other brands got in on the action, and space for large-scale posters began being leased out. By the early 1900s, billboards became standardized, right around the time that more cars were beginning to fill the roads. But from there, with the small but impactful exception of the introduction of outdoor electric lighting, not much has changed in the billboard landscape. Even when brands occasionally try out something new, like the Coors Light waterfall billboard or basically anything that's ever been in Times Square, Egan notes, quote, Cool, unique campaigns like these are largely one-off displays meant to garner online buzz and light press attention. With the exception of the national Chick-fil-A Eat More Chicken campaign that used sculptures of cows to create 3D billboards, very little outdoor advertising goes much further than static images and text printed on vinyl sheets by the side of the road. End quote. Could that finally be changing, though? Even though static vinyl billboards are much more reliable, the digital ones have the advantage of being able to be updated remotely, a particular advantage these days. And Egan points to the changing nature of marketing to consumers in general, quoting one advertising firm as saying, Today's consumers are much smarter and well-informed than they were 30 years ago. Therefore, merely repeating a message to the average individual is not a viable strategy for return on investment. In 2021, along with a great website design, Google SEO, and content creation, advertisers will need to incorporate technology and customer preference in their advertising models to keep the spirit of advertising alive. And End quote. There is so much that could be unpacked there. For one, how do we compare online advertising to traditional billboards? 
In a sort of meta commentary, Egan even notes in this article that he had trouble researching this topic online because searching for the term advertising paired with history of just comes up with a minefield of SEO pumped ad firm websites. If anyone knows how to manipulate SEO to their advantage, it's advertisers. But then there's the personalization element. There's a reason influencers have become such a huge thing. A little over a decade ago, it became clear to advertisers that consumers of the day were less loyal to brands simply based on name recognition than previous generations, and more discerning about the product and company itself. We aren't buying a particular brand of butter because it's what our parents used, or because we remembered seeing a nice ad for it in a magazine. We look things up online to get the best deal, or read countless reviews from strangers to pick what we view as the best product. As the information age morphed into the communication age, it became more about those reviews, about a digital word of mouth, about trusting what someone we follow online says, even if we know they're being paid to tell us that. Of course, even that is now something more and more of us are beginning to actively distrust, so who knows where that will leave us. But the bottom line is, advertisers are well aware that their only hope right now is personalization. Continuing to penetrate and beef up each of our individual filter bubbles so we're inundated with products we didn't even realize we wanted, but now can't resist. And as advertisers reckon with what that means for roadside advertising, I'm reminded of a story I mentioned on this show back in May about Ford patenting technology that would display personalized, location-based ads on your car's display screen. The idea behind that one is personalization, of course, but also allegedly to be helpful, like so many devices we're selling our souls to nowadays. If you pass by an intriguing billboard but don't have time to capture all the information, your car would display it for you and ask if you'd like to reroute your directions to that place of business. The fact that part of the pitch is drivers not being able to read the whole ad reminds me of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, when Clarice McClellan tells protagonist Montag that out in the country, they have billboards 200 feet long because cars were driving by too fast to read the traditional 20-foot ads. And just for scale here, billboards in the U.S. today are typically 48 feet long, although some specialty ones, like that Coors Light waterfall in Dallas, are much larger. That one's 150 feet long. But there are other innovations being trialed as well, beyond the maybe, hopefully, never happening in-car displays, like ones that are interactive in various ways, either with the environment or through your device. Egan shared a great example of a British Airways digital billboard that connected to flight path information. It showed a child excitedly looking up at the sky anytime a real airplane passed overhead, and then it would switch to a screen that said, for example, look, it's BA Flight 475 from Barcelona. Now that's admittedly a pretty cool tie-in, and one that probably works better in an urban setting where pedestrians can stop to enjoy it, as opposed to drivers getting distracted trying to watch the whole thing. Although again, as Egan pointed out earlier, that's a bit more of a flash in the pan garnering earned media on top of the ad concept rather than the billboard being effective unto itself. And though they're not usually ads, there's been a growing number of ultra-realistic 3D displays popping up in cities, most notably of late the giant cat on the building in Tokyo. And Phoenix, Arizona is trying to get in on that too with a proposal for a 10-story tall LED statue that would shapeshift into, well, pretty much anything on the hour. AZ Central says it could take on the form of Beyonce, or Spider-Man, or John Lennon, or even passers-by themselves if they upload a selfie. And while these are all currently just art displays, they make you think about what ads might look like in the future. Intrusive, 3D digital displays with plenty of opportunity for interactivity. But I don't know, at the end of the day, the good old 2D print billboards still seem the most reliable, and maybe even the most effective long term. One stat that I loved from Egan's Tedium article is that according to the Out of Home Advertising Association of America, the number one category with the most billboard real estate in the U.S. is still miscellaneous local services and amusements. So, despite all the flashy attempts from big corporations, the roadside signs letting you know about a local small-town diner still rule the day. So, when he was filling in for me, Glenn mentioned the story of the Michigan man who found over 160 bowling balls under his house when he was renovating. 
Weird, I know. Listen to the Wednesday, July 14th episode for the full story of how and why the bowling balls got under that man's house, but I bring it up because this guy turned out to be a great candidate to find these bowling balls, at least when it comes to getting rid of them. The man donated several of them to a local church for a bowling ball cannon at a pig roast, whatever that all means, gave a number of them to his stepfather for use in making custom furniture, and will be using the rest himself for landscaping and sculptures. Pretty great example of creative upcycling there, and it turns out that's kind of your only option when it comes to bowling balls. You can't recycle bowling balls, despite what some may think. And when I say some, I mean a surprising amount of people, especially in New York City. Earlier this summer, Curbed reported on the curious case of bowling balls in New York City's recycling. More than 1,200 bowling balls turn up a year at Sims Municipal Recycling in Brooklyn, the U.S.'s largest recycling facility. That's three to four bowling balls a day. And General Manager Tom Outerbridge says since the facility only takes in residential recycling, they're not all coming wholesale from a bowling alley or manufacturer. They're also probably not coming from pros, who know enough about the construction of bowling balls to know that they're not recyclable. Quoting Curbed, From a recycler's perspective, bowling balls pose two problems. The first is that they're typically made of thermoset plastic, which means the bonds between its molecules are stronger than those in something like a single-use water bottle, making them difficult or impossible to be melted down and reshaped. The second is that they simply contain too many types of materials. Aluminum cans, for example, are made of mostly aluminum, while bowling balls are a composite of dozens of plastics, paints, and other chemicals." End quote. Fortunately, they're also not the worst thing that you could throw away. Benjamin Miller, a former New York City Department of Sanitation official and the author of Fat of the Land, a 200-year history of the New York City's garbage, told Curbed that bowling balls don't emit greenhouse gases and don't leach anything into the water or the earth. So that's good, I guess, but it would still probably be better if we found other uses for them. Quoting again, If there's a way to reuse a bowling ball, someone's tried it. Pinteresters turned them into lawn ornaments, one Reddit user claims to have used them in target practice, and in 1987, a zoo in Illinois gave them to animals as toys. But they damaged cages, plugged draining holes, and inspired an alarming possessiveness in at least one male lion. Pros often donate old equipment to youth leagues, end quote. There have been attempts to repurpose them. One bowling ball designer was able to figure out a method of grinding them down to asphalt, but the cost and energy exerted made it basically not worth it. And meanwhile, people keep getting rid of bowling balls in surprising numbers, making them just another item in our world that's filling up the landfills in larger amounts than we usually think about. Quoting again, Since the 1960s, we've produced 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic globally, only 9% of which have ever been recycled. End quote. So, if you find 160 bowling balls under your house, or you just have one laying around you've been meaning to get rid of, before you toss it in the trash, see if you can come up with another use for it first. Try donating it to a local youth league. See if a crafty DIY friend wants to use it for a project. Or take a leaf out of that Michigan church's book and make a bowling ball cannon. Just don't try to recycle it. Ending today with just a cool little story. So there are a lot of fan creators online making awesome things, and sometimes they even make stuff better than the original source material depending on who you ask. But in some cases, they objectively show up the original creators. And that's the case of uber-talented YouTube creator Shamook, who produces all kinds of deep fakes, like putting Tobey Maguire into the Tom Holland Spider-Man movies, or fixing Superman's mustache in the Justice League. They've also improved some of the CGI in the Star Wars movies, and those particular videos not only garnered them millions of views, but has now landed them a job with Lucasfilm's Industrial Light and Magic. George Lucas has a long history of supporting burgeoning filmmakers who make Star Wars fan videos, even as he historically tried to stamp out written fan fiction. so this turn of events isn't a huge surprise, but is still very cool. It kind of reminds me of, like, white hat hackers getting hired by a big company after showing them the vulnerabilities in their system. 
A Lucasfilm rep told IndieWire, quote, Industrial Light and Magic is always on the lookout for talented artists and have, in fact, hired the artist that goes by the online persona, Shamook. Over the past several years, ILM has been investing in both machine learning and AI as a means to produce compelling visual effects work, and it's been terrific to see momentum building in this space as the technology advances, end quote. So a cool win for fans and online creators, and hey, maybe we'll even see better CGI in upcoming Star Wars productions, too. So quick production note before I go today. I am traveling again unexpectedly this week, but the show will go on with me still at the helm. I'll be doing a mixture of pre-recording some stuff and doing a little recording from the road. So if you notice a slight change in audio quality or maybe episodes go up on the later side due to poor internet connection, bear with me. I will be back in my own space and finally done traveling come this Monday the 2nd. But until then, thank you all so much for listening. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kaki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.